All right. Romans is what we're starting out in. Everyone needs to know it's going to take a while to get through Romans. Romans was written by Paul. Paul intended Romans to be his teaching tool if he didn't make it to Rome. So he wrote and told them and basically gave them a complete guideline to the gospel in Romans. So we're going to take it a little at a time, probably a chapter at a time. How are you today? All right, so we're into session one, and we're going to start out the log. In other words, that's uh, kind of an introduction to Romans. Paul wrote this letter. Remember, epistles, when they talk about epistles, and a lot of people are all sitting out there going, okay, what are epistles? Epistles just simply a Greek word that means letters. Paul wrote this letter under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit for several reasons. He wanted to prepare the way for his intended visit to the church. He evidently hoped that Rome would become a base of operations and support for his missionary work in Spain. Because he did plan as soon as he got to Rome, he was going to go right on to Spain and continue his missionary work and the western portions of the empire that he had not yet evangelized. His full exposition of the gospel in this letter provided a solid foundation for their participation in this mission. And I fully believe that this letter that he sent to them there in Rome was copied many times and spread all around Rome to all the churches there, and they were in very good spiritual condition when he got there. I think it kind of surprised him. As Paul looked forward to returning to Jerusalem between his departure from Corinth, which, which is where he wrote Romans, and his arrival in Rome, he was aware of the danger he faced. He wrote the exhaustive exposition of, this, of the gospel that we have in Romans to set forth his teaching in case he did not reach Rome. From Rome, his guideline could then be, go out to the rest of the empire as others preached it. Another reason for writing Romans is Paul's desire to minister the, to the spiritual needs of the Christians that are already in Rome, even though, as it turns out, they are in good spiritual condition. The common problems of all the early churches are dangers to the, are dangers to the Roman church as well. These difficulties included internal conflicts and external threats from false teachers. Paul gave both problems attention in this epistle. Paul wrote Romans because his ministry in the Aegean region was solid enough that he planned to leave it and move farther west into new territory. Before he did, he planned to visit Jerusalem where he realized he would be in danger. Paul wrote Romans to leave a full exposition of the gospel in good hands if his ministry ended prematurely in Jerusalem. That's why he wrote it, because he knew that when he went there, he was going to be in danger, and there was a possibility that he would be delayed in his route to Rome. The whole of the epistle must be grasped. In other words, all of Romans needs to be grasped. No other book of the New Testament lends itself to more dangerous distortions of truth through fragmentary use. In other words, you take just one little piece out of it, and that's how a lot of these religions and false religions out there got started. They found one little thing in Romans or one little thing in the Gospels, and that little fragment they built an entire religion off of. Paul knew that the best protection against infection from false teaching is to immunize with the truth. And that's what we do here every Tuesday. We immunize with the truth so that you have something because when we're teaching and we're speaking, everything that you see comes out of the Bible. 
Now, I will have some commentary, but the commentary is not going to stray from what God intends the Bible or what he intends his word to mean. And it is up to y'all to always search the scriptures to make sure that I'm right. Romans 1 through 17, the great epistle begins with a broad perspective. It looks at the promise of a Savior in the Old Testament, reviews Paul's ministry to date, and surveys the religious history of the Gentile world. Paul, in his wisdom, and of course through the Holy Spirit, constantly, even in Acts, he was constantly pointing everybody back to the Old Testament. He said, go back and read the Old Testament. It tells you that, th that we had a Savior coming. Jesus is it. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. Paul regarded himself as the purchased possession of his Lord and Master. Called an apostle. An apostle means sent one. One that was commissioned. Separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before by his prophets, in the Holy Scriptures. He constantly points back to the Old Testament. He said the prophets told about this. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made the seed, made meaning born of the seed of David according to the flesh, in other words, through human form, and declared the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom are you also called of Jesus Christ. Now you're going to have a lot of really, really intelligent people out there, and most all the commentaries immediately go apoplectic over this. In other words, they melt down because it said we instead of I, because they said Paul received the grace and apostleship. No, that's not what it said. What it says is we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. And that means exactly what it says. When you have the faith, when you come into the faith and you are obedient to the faith, you are obedient to God, in all things that he asks of you, you are then becoming an apostle sent out by him to shine the light to the rest of the world. And he said in the second part of it here, among whom are you also called of Jesus Christ? Among whom are you also the called? That word means saints. You are the saints of Jesus Christ. I know it says called here, and it's called, it says that in the Bible, but you go and you study the Word, and it tells you this means the saints of God is who he's talking about. To all that are in Rome, beloved of God, called saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And you'll find that both called and saints that are, that are written here are both the same word in Greek. The first sentence, which is the first seven verses that we just read, that is only one sentence, implicitly sets forth the fundamental facts of Christianity. It shows that the main truths of the gospel, and everybody remembers that gospel just simply means the good news. Gospel fulfill Old Testament prophecies. The good news is not an offbeat distortion of Judaism. It is the fulfillment of God's plan, a new plan, a different plan. The prophets of the Old Testament pointed forward to someone who is coming. Christ is the great personal object to which the promise referred. Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the Son of God, and certain Jews are offended by this claim. So are many people today offended by this claim, saying that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And Jesus Christ said, no one comes to the Father but by me, through me. It's the only way you're going to come to see the Father. And that offends many people. I don't 
care that it offends many people. It needs to offend many people. It needs to get them into the gospel and understanding there is only one God and Jesus Christ is the way. Christ is uniquely the child of the woman. Talked about in 1 Timothy and Galatians and also in the Gospels. He is a descendant of David by his birth, by his human birth. Since his human mother belonged to David's family. As to his divine holiness, Jesus had no human father. But God himself, by means of the Holy Spirit, is the father of Jesus. But more than this, Jesus is the eternal Logos. And people hear that word, Logos, what does that mean? Logos just simply means the divine expression of God. Jesus is the divine expression of God. He is the Word in human form. Both humanity and divinity are united in Jesus. Paul never thought of himself as a man who aspired to an honor. He thought of himself as a man given a task that he is eager to accomplish. Paul's mission is to proclaim the good news so people are given the opportunity to believe and obey. These Christians currently in Rome believed and obeyed. God called them to Christ through the good news. Paul sends this letter to all who are God's people in Rome and to all who follow Christ after them, which is us. Christians are uniquely God's own people. And saint means one that is consecrated to God, which is God's own people. Just, you know, it's amazing that we have a God that is willing to have a relationship with us. So stop listening to all these people who say that God is something that's, you know, this, he's far out, he's, he's an absentee father that he doesn't really care what we do down here. We just need to try to live as good a life right now until we get into heaven. That, that is false teaching. That is false prophets that bring that kind of garbage to you. Verse 5 tells us that the saints received grace and apostleship through obedience to the faith. Faith is obedience to God because God commands everyone to believe in Christ. And that statement is backed up in John 6, 29. Jesus answered and said to them, and I kind of set this up. Remember when uh, Jesus had fed, I don't remember if it was the 4,000 or the 5,000, when he had fed them and everything was done and everybody was kind of pushing in because they wanted to try to make Jesus their king, well, Jesus got on a boat and slipped away from them that evening and went to the other side. Well, when they woke up the next morning, he was gone. They went looking for him, so they went over to the other side as well. And when they found him and they said, you know, you slipped off, you know, where, where, where did you go? And Jesus said, you're not truly following me because of all the miracles that I presented to you. You're following me because I filled your belly. And they said, well, show us how to do these works. Jesus tells them and answered and said to them, this is the work or the service to God that you believe on him whom he has sent. He sent Jesus. And that's who they're supposed to be believing on. And they will be able to do the works of God. Amen. Acts 17, 30 and 31, and the times of this ignorance, it's kind of another backup to it, the times of this ignorance, in other words, the time before Christ, God winked at, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man, Jesus, whom he has ordained whereof he has given him assurance, or given assurance to all men, in that he has raised him from the dead. This is not teaching that saving faith always results in ongoing obedience to God, though that should be its effect. We know that it's not because people get saved and they go back out and start living the same life that they already had. Verse 8 First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all 
that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. So Paul's already heard about the faith of the, people, of the Christians that are in Rome. One of the first lessons of effective leadership is the, is the importance of setting priorities. Not only must things be done right, which is management, but right things must be done. That is leadership. Did y'all get that? For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come to you. I'm still praying to God that I can come to you at the time that he wrote this because it was in Corinth. Reminding us that the real work of the ministry is prayer. Preaching is more a result of the ministry of prayer than it is a ministry itself. A sermon that does not rise from heart-searching prayer has no ch chance of bearing any real fruit. That includes me standing up here and teaching you. If I don't go through here and put everything together, hopefully so that you can completely understand everything that's being taught out of this glorious book, then I didn't do my due diligence in prayer and thinking and bringing this up before God. For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to the end that you may be established. But that is that I may be comforted together with you by mutual faith of you and me. Paul is saying, I desire to convey whatever spiritual gift is needed that you may be set firm in your faith. Not that I would imply any accusation of weakness or instability. That's what the but means. But that I desire for you the strengthening of which I also stand in need along with you and which I hope may be produced in, both of us, in us both through our personal association and our mutual faith. Now I would not have you ignorant, brothers, that oftentimes I purposed to come to you. He tried many times to go to Rome, but was prevented up to this time that I might have some fruit among you also. He wanted to join in the harvest there in Rome. That's what he was talking about here. Even as among other Gentiles, I am a debtor, what does it mean to be a debtor? What does it mean to be a debtor? It means he has an obligation. You know, when we come into the service of Christ, we now have an obligation, both to the Greeks, which means the Gentiles, and to the barbarians, it means to all the other Gentiles, meaning foreigners. And this is the way Paul speaks because Greeks are considered to be the intelligent people, the wise people, <laughs> and the barbarians as everyone else that's not a Jew. Both to the wise, saying the same thing again, both to the wise and the unwise. So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are in Rome also. Every Christian is indebted to every non-Christian because we have and can give what can impart life to those who are dead in sin. And that means the gospel, the good news, telling them about Jesus Christ. There is a better way. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Now the salutation is ended. Now the salvo starts. And his salvo is long. And it's good. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation to everyone that believes. Everyone that believes the gospel of Christ is saved. Amen. To the Jew first, which he did everywhere he went. The first people he visited would be the Jews of the city. And he would impart everything that had to do about the gospel. And in every instance, he met the same fate. They mostly rejected him and walked away and wanted to have nothing more to do with him. But there were a few and it was always the few he was there for. It doesn't matter how many people reject the gospel when you're talking to them. It's the fact that you keep telling them and keep talking it and keep going out there and presenting it because there's always going to be someone 
that decides the lesson and wants to accept. To the Jew first and also to the Greek, meaning Gentile, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. That is the theme of the rest of the chapter. The just will live by faith. Thus ends the letter's introduction and transitions into Paul's primary subject. Notwithstanding, the Great Commission makes no distinction between Jews and Gentiles in this present age. Jesus Christ has charged Christians with taking the gospel to everyone. And you can read all about that in Matthew chapter 28. God has the power to deliver physically, which is what you can read about in Exodus, and spiritually, which is actually all throughout the Bible, but it's pretty well talked about in Psalm 51. The outcome of salvation is soundness or wholeness of mind, soul, and body. There is a change in you. It's a big change. Salvation restores people to what they cannot experience because of sin. Salvation is an umbrella term. It covers all aspects of deliverance. The terms justification, Redemption, reconciliation, sanctification, and glorification all describe different aspects of salvation. So let's not get confused by terms. When it's talking about those things, it's talking about the salvation of Jesus Christ. The gospel does not announce that everyone is safe because of what Jesus Christ did. That's called universalism. Because we have teachers out there right now saying, Jesus Christ did all the work. You don't have to worry about it. There's nothing you have to do. <laughs> don't worry about it. Just go home, live your life. And when you die, you'll be before Jesus Christ. No, you will not. That is universalism. And we have many, many churches in the United States that teach this philosophy because that's what it is. It's a philosophy. It is not God's law. The gospel is only effective in those who believe it. Believe the good news, the news that Jesus, Christ, Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, whom God promised to send and that he has done everything necessary to save us. Everyone in this room believes that. Note that Paul mentioned no other condition besides believing the good news including in a crucial verse in Romans 4, 5, where it says, but to him that works not, in other words, to the law, but believes on him, Jesus Christ, that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness, just as Abraham was. He says nothing about our needing to do anything in addition, such as baptism, joining a church, pledging commitments, etc., the issue is believing good news and trusting Christ. Either a person does or does not do so. But once you get saved, once you accept Jesus Christ and you start your walk, then everything in you wants to do the works that is being baptized. It is joining a church or joining a group, a body of the, the body of Christ, and pledging commitments. Those are part of your outworkings of faith. Amen? Amen? A person either does or does not do so. It's almost a Yoda saying, there is no try, there is either do or do not. And this is for me. I know that people have heard me say that Jesus is the last and final sacrifice sent by his Father. He is God's answer to sin, to bring all humanity back into community with him, to be reconciled to him. God is not going to allow his son's sacrifice to be made insignificant or trivial by anyone. Our father is literally saying, this is it, this is my gift, available to all. It is available to everyone. There is nothing else that will bring your salvation, bring you salvation from sin. Accept it 
or don't. To reject the gift his son has made possible and available to all will kindle a righteous anger in him no one should want to stand before. Now, we don't serve an angry God, but rejecting his gift makes him angry, most especially those that stand around saying, I don't need Jesus, I can get to God myself. That is a foul stench to God. And it will kindle the anger in him. Now, you think if he, you know, there's a lot out there that preach that God is just, you know, he, he's loving and kind and all these things, and he is without a doubt. But we have to understand that's for us. For all those out there that are lost, he's letting them go on and do their own thing just like they've been doing for so long. But when it comes time for judgment, he's going to look at them and say, you rejected everything that I had for you. And there's only one place you're going, and that's to the lake of fire. People don't want to believe that. They don't want to believe that there is a hell. They don't want to believe that you're going to be in hell forever. I don't care what they don't want to believe. That's the way it is because that's what's written in God's word, and he doesn't mince words about it. There is a place for them to go. The need for God's righteousness. See, Paul sets everything up in a manner that, okay, God had been saying how that, you know, Jesus Christ is coming. He talked about it through the prophets. And now he's going to show you what it is about man as to why it is he needs God and why he needs a Savior. Paul began his explanation of the gospel by demonstrating that there is a universal need for it. Every human being needs to trust in Jesus Christ because everyone lacks the righteousness that God requires before he will accept us. We cannot be righteous by ourselves before God. That's why he sent his son and his son made the way for us. We believe on him and accept the gift that he gave us and we're righteous before God. That's how we're righteous. And we stand righteous right now before God but only through his son. Verse 18, Paul still speaking here, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. The lack of reverence for and rebellion against God is what ungodliness is, and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. How do you hold truth in unrighteousness? You prevent others from getting it. You oppress. That wasn't what it means to hold. People know about God but suppress the truth through their wickedness. Evil men inflict blindness upon themselves and others and so prevent the truth from being known. If you teach and preach a lie, you're blinded by God. And all those that listen to you without going to the Word and studying it themselves, they're blinded as well. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. What he's saying there is that there is a part of God in every single human being walking this earth, whether they ever accept, accept Jesus Christ or not. God made us. He made Adam. He breathed into Adam. A part of God is in Adam. And that was passed on to all of us. You cannot escape that. For God has shown it to them. How did he show it? But how is God's wrath revealed? Well, one of the answers is given in context as we're coming into the rest of the of Romans, God gives men over to uncleanness. He does it in verse 24, to vile affections, verse 26, and to a reprobate mind in verse 28. But it is also true that God occasionally breaks through into human history to show his extreme displeasure at man's sin. For example, it would be the flood in Genesis 7, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 19, and the punishment where the earth just opened up and swallowed Korah, Dathan, and Abiram in number 16. So God will intervene at times, 
But for, for, but for the rest of the time, he allows people to, you know, they want to be wicked, they want to be evil in their own ways. And however it is that they're doing it, it's all going to come back on them. Are the heathen who have never heard the gospel lost? And I've heard this argument from a lot of people that say, well, what about the people who live off in the jungle someplace and have never heard the word of God and accepted Jesus Christ? Paul shows that they are lost, not because of knowledge they don't have, but because of the light which they do have. Every one of them has a piece of God in them. Your soul came from God. That's where your soul comes from. But because of the light which they do have, yet refuse. They can see God in everything. But they want to say that, you know, all this happened by accident. That's your evolutionists. Those things which may be known of God in creation have been revealed to them. God has not left them without a revelation of himself. The point is there is enough about God which can be known that the evil men of Romans 1.18 have no excuse for their action. They're without excuse. And that's what God continues to say throughout his Bible. Verse 20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Let that sink in a second. That's kind of an oxymoron. Invisible seen. For the invisible things of him, God, from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Well, it may sound like an oxymoron, but it is a spiritual truth. Being understood by the things that are made. In other words, you see all the plants, all the animals, you see the sun, moon, and stars. Even his eternal power and Godhead so that they, the ungodly and unrighteous, are without excuse. And that's exactly what Paul is setting out. He's trying to say nobody has an excuse. If they reject what is being told them here, they're going to a place they will not like. Because that when they knew or perceived that there is a God, they did not glorify him as God, Neither were they thankful for all the things that we've got around us. You know, if we didn't have trees on the earth, we wouldn't have oxygen being regenerated into the atmosphere. That didn't happen through evolution. That didn't happen by accident. It is impossible. I mean, a mathematician can put out the odds of all the things happening together that need to happen in order for all this stuff just to be happening by itself. And they'd let you know real quick it was impossible for it to happen. Because that when they knew or perceived there is a God, they glorified him not as God, neither were they thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. So when you become vain in your imaginations, trying to think of all the evolution, how this world evolved, and how it was other gods, it must have been other gods because you start worshiping trees or you start worshiping the sun or the moon or whatever in their vain imaginations, their foolish hearts were darkened. The statement here is clear. Creation demands a creator. Design demands a designer. By looking at the sun, moon, stars, every plant and every creature, everyone can know there is a God. There is a higher being that did all of this. The answer to the question, what about the heathen, is this. They are without excuse. God has revealed himself to them in creation, but they have not responded to this revelation. Although they know by his works there is a higher divine power responsible for creation, they, never, they neither seek for the one responsible nor glorify him as creator or thank him for all he has done. 
When men in their pride deliberately blind themselves to the truth, they plunge deeper into the darkness of evil. And that's the reason why you see so much of the evil going on in our world right now because they reject this. They reject this truth and the more they reject it and the longer they reject it, the deeper into the darkness they go. Ever since creation, enough evidence has been present to prevent anyone from worshiping lifeless images. There is no excuse. Then, since no one can claim ignorance, yet still they give themselves over to useless philosophies and speculations about other gods, and as a result, lose the capacity to see and think clearly. Light rejected is light denied. Those who don't want to see lose the capacity to see. That's what God's saying. You refuse to see it, ah, he'll turn you over to whatever blindness you want to put yourself into. The writings of Plato, Xenophon, Plutarch, Cicero, and other philosophers prove that even the learned heathens, though ignorant of the way of salvation, were quite acquainted with the unity and spirituality of God. They knew there was a higher being, but would only acknowledge him in hypothetical or theoretical ways and at times believing themselves more intelligent. There are so many men walking this earth right now that consider themselves to be of higher intelligence than God because they look at his word not understanding how to read it and they make all kinds of false assumptions and start saying all kinds of false things against God. God looks at those kind of people and goes, <laughs> yeah, that's okay, Bubba, your time's coming. Amen. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Amen. We see that every day. Intelligence does not keep anyone from making a fool of himself. The Greeks and Romans were proud of the wisdom and all of the learning that they did, but their worship of images showed them to be fools. They worshiped false idols and changed the glory of the uncorruptible, immortal God into an image made like to a corruptible man. Look at all these different Im images that people worship. Yes, people do worship angels. They are not supposed to be worshiping angels or their idols or their figures. And all these different other religions out there, they've got all their little things that they put up, including Baphomet there. Baphomet's a big one coming up now. You've seen him in the news quite a bit here in the last few years. Baphomet is Satan. Baphomet, this one right here. Remember, they've been trying to put his statue up in several places around the nation and have managed to get them into some courthouses because they want him right next to the, to the Ten Commandments. They claim equal rights. We have to have equal rights. Well, this nation wasn't founded on them. It was founded on godly principles. And to birds, those who worship birds. I'm sure there's about a thousand different birds I could have put on here but there are people who worship different birds. Four-footed beasts. You see people with their little elephant statues, and that is one of the biggest Indian, as far as over in India, they have an elephant god that they worship. Their elephant god, though, of course, is for good luck, brings them all good fortune and money. And, of course, everybody should recognize this idol. This is the one that was the calf, the golden calf that was created while they were coming out of Egypt. And then this one right here, this bull, this bull sits, I believe, in New York City around the uh, financial district. They consider themselves to be the bulls. You know, they, so they, they worship the bull markets most especially, because, but this is basically a representation of greed. And creeping things, yes, they worship frogs, snakes, crickets, turtles, you name it, all kinds of creeping things. Anything and everything that you can imagine that they want to worship, they create that as their god. Fish, I'm sure I could have come up with the dolphins and the whales and all the other things that are being worshipped by people today. It's not 
the, the creature was never intended to be worshipped. Mythology and idolatry have resulted from man's need to identify some power that is greater than himself. But he continues to refuse to acknowledge God as that power. Man, men and women have elevated themselves to God's position. It talks about that in Daniel, but we have people even today they are elevating themselves into God's position. In our day, humanism has replaced the worship of individual human leaders in most developed countries, except China. China's going back the other direction. Uh, Chairman Xi, he is now the one that they're going to be required to worship. All of the Christian churches are being shut down, the pictures of Christ taken off the wall, all the crosses taken off the wall, and pictures of Chairman Xi is being hung up, and that is who they are to turn their worship to now. So continue to pray for our brothers in China. They are definitely under heavy persecution. Man has descended to the worship of animals as well. This is perhaps more characteristic of third world countries. And you'll notice in more developed countries, they're secular humanists. They worship themselves. They worship other people. But in third world countries, you'll find that most of them are worshiping animals. Now, we have more than enough of our animal worshipers here in America as well, but it's not as prevalent as self-worship for, uh, for this country. As men grew more conceited over their self-styled knowledge, they plunged deeper into ignorance and nonsense. These two things always characterize those who reject the knowledge of God. They don't want God to even be in their mind. And even though they worship things like the uh, evolution, they don't want to say that's a religion. They, oh no, that, that doesn't meet the qualifications. I'm more intelligent than you are. That is not a religion. Evolution is a religion. Because they have faith in evolution over God. They become insufferably conceited and abysmally ignorant at the same time. Man is instinctively religious. He must have some object to worship. When he refuses to worship the living God, he makes his own gods of wood and stone, representing man, birds, animals, and creeping things, or reptiles. Note the downward progression, man, birds, animals, creeping things. He, he degrades himself all the way down to creeping things. And remember, man becomes like what he worships. As, it, as his concept of deity degenerates, his morals degenerate. Remember, too, that a worshiper generally considers himself inferior to the object of worship. Created in the image after the likeness of God, that's who we are. We were created in the image after the likeness of God. But these men here, they take a place lower than that of serpents. When man worships idols, the, he worships demons. Paul states clearly that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice to idols, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. That's in 1 Corinthians. Verse 24, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness, which means here moral impurity, through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Our Creator is blessed forever. Amen. Amen. Some believe images were originally intended to help focus the mind on God. However, in time, the image became God for them, and God, the Creator, was forgotten. God gave man over in verses 24, 26, and 28 by turning him over to the punishment of his crime earned, as a judge does, a prisoner. Hosea 4.17 said that uh, since Ephraim, that's talking about Ephraim, which literally meant fruitful, the largest tribe in the northern kingdom that stood for the whole nation of Israel had abandoned his shepherd, had abandoned God, for idols. God called others to leave them alone. He said, leave him alone. 
he would abandon, God would abandon him to the judgment that would come inevitably from pursuing sin. Ephraim had become incorrigible. They turned to idols and turned away from God, so God turned away from them. What do you expect when you turn away from God? The third characteristic of man in rebellion against God that Paul identified after ignorance in verse 21 and idolatry in verse 23 is moral impurity. Here Paul had natural forms of moral uncleanness in view. In response to the evil lusts of their hearts, God abandoned them to sexual uncleanness, adultery, lewdness, prostitution, harlotry, etc., Life became for them a round of sex orgies in which to do or to dishonor their bodies among themselves. They were doing it then, they're doing it now. The underbelly of San Antonio is full of it. This abandonment by God was because they first abandoned the truth about him for the lie of idolatry. An idol is a lie, a false representation of God. An idolater worships the image of a creature and thus insults and dishonors the Creator who is eternally worthy of honor and glory, not of insult. For this cause, the same reason, changing the truth of God into a lie, God gave them up to vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust one toward another. Men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meat. Meat meaning necessary. In other words, this sin curses and finally destroys the one who practices such things. Because mankind exchanged the truth for the lie, God allowed him to degrade himself through his passions. In other words, he turned him over to his passion. The result was that he exchanged natural human functions for what is unnatural. Turning away from the marriage relationship ordained by God, men burned with lust for one another, for other men, and practiced homosexuality, and the women likewise, and lesbianism. But their sin took its toll in their bodies and their souls. Disease, guilt, personality deformities struck at them like the sting of a scorpion. This disproves the notion that anyone can commit this sin and get away with it. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, they want to kick God out of their knowledge because if they acknowledge God, they have to admit they're wrong and sinful. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. And things that are not convenient is sinning. Being filled with all unrighteousness, which means an unjust person that is morally bankrupt. Fornication, which goes into harlotry, adultery, incest, and idolatry. Yes, fornication includes idolatry. Wickedness, depravity, malice, covetousness, which means greed and extortion. Covetousness means that people want something and they can find a way to extort it from you, uh, blackmail you, they'll do it. That's what this uh, word of covetousness means. Maliciousness means to be spiteful, vindictive, loves creating trouble, revels in their naughtiness. That seems to be a new thing these days. You see it in a lot of the magazines and all the things that's going on out there. All these people that say, oh, I love being naughty. Well, that's not what God says. God says that, that you are on a road that you're not going to enjoy. Full of envy, ill will, and jealousy is what that means. Murder means unjustified slaughter. does not include war. Debate. This doesn't mean somebody who just sits down and they sit and exchange an idea trying to get to the uh, understanding of it. It means to create strife, quarrel among people, and be contentious at all times. Deceit means to be trick into trickery, tricking people, guile, false flags, decoys. Malignity means mischievousness and a flawed character. 
whisperers, some of the worst people. They are slanderers, a secret culminator. In other words, they gather up all the secrets about people that they can so that they can use it against them and blackmail them. Make false and, deform and defamatory statements about you. Backbiters, those who defame you to others, haters of God. That is all who reject God or his word. Despite, or, uh, despiteful or injurious insults. And that's going on continuously th these days, even in politics. And if a Christian raises up their head to try to hold up their Christian values, then they have people that are firing salvos at them to try to keep them from being able to, ever to have a job. They're trying to do what they did to the Jews back years ago to the Christians today. Proud means haughty, acting above others. Boasters, simply means braggarts. Inventors of evil things, those who unjustly devise harm to others. Disobedient to parents, that needs no explanation. Your child is either obedient or they're not. Without understanding means foolish. Foolish people have no understanding, really don't want to have any understanding. Without understanding. Covenant breakers, that means treacherous people. Without natural affection means hard-hearted. Implacable means will not allow peace, and they are truce breakers. So the Palestinian Authority over, in e over next to uh, Israel, they are implacable because they don't want peace with Israel. They want Israel dead. They are unmerciful, without compassion or empathy. These people are so amoral that they have lost all sense of good and evil. People who have refused to acknowledge God end up with minds that are darkened from being able to understand and acknowledge the will of God. Those whom God cannot convince, he confuses. As people disapproved of the idea of retaining God in their thinking, so God gave them over to a condemned mind. This letting loose has led to all kinds of illogical and irrational behavior. When Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, he expounded on the same evil in the last days, 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 through 12, even him talking about the false prophet, whose coming is after the working of Satan, the Antichrist, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because those that are perish are unbelievers, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And there's many people out there right now that you can look at, they take great pleasure in unrighteousness. Who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same things on purpose, but have pleasure in them that do it, and they even teach them how to sin. The final step down in man's degradation is his promotion of wickedness. It is bad to practice these things, but it is even worse to encourage others to practice them. God's law of right and wrong is written in the minds of every human being. The Gentile philosophers showed they knew this by the things they wrote. This is a deliberate act because they know what God's law says, knowing the consequences they sin anyway, and approve of others who do the same things and actually teach people how to sin. This is the longest list of this type in the New Testament. Its purpose is to show the scope of social evils that results when God's hands, God hands people over to a depraved mind after they refuse to acknowledge him. The great contribution of this letter to the New Testament is the reasoned explanation of how God's righteousness can become man's possession. In the development of this theme, Paul shows that Jew and Gentile are alike violators of divine law and are consequently exposed to the divine wrath. 
from which there is no deliverance through works or ordinances, but only through the gospel of Jesus Christ accepted by faith. Amen. Amen. So these teachers out there that say that the only evil comes from Satan, well, he is evil, absolutely. But it's not God is not doing evil when he brings judgment. He is righteous in his judgments. And by them speaking evil of the judgments that God brings, I don't want to be in their shoes. So then When you reject his inv invitation, you are given over to a depraved mind. But you're not just simply given over to Satan. You already belong to Satan in this world. You have to get out from under Satan's rule by accepting Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Any comments, questions? God is good. All the time. Amen. All right. Let's take communion.